Please be seated. And I would invite you to turn off your sacred electrical, electronic devices, cell phones, etc. Welcome to the 2017 Multi-Faith Baccalaureate Service at Dartmouth College. Historically, the baccalaureate service was a time set aside for students to expound on all they had learned in their academic experience. While we no longer ask our soon-to-be graduates to summarize their learning in Latin sermons, we have maintained the tradition of inviting students to articulate some sense of knowledge or insight that they have acquired during their tenure at Dartmouth, each from his or her own experiences, sacred texts, or beliefs. One teaching that is shared by many traditions is that all living beings are interconnected. Whatever affects one indirectly, whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. As the author Terry Tempest Williams writes, we are animal, we are earth, we are water. We are a community of human beings living on this planet together. And we forget that. We become disconnected. We lose our center point of gravity, that stillness that allows us to listen to life on a deeper level and to meet each other in fully authentic and present ways. Today, we are blessed to hear our students reflect on moments of deep connection and sometimes disconnection as they sought to explore individual identity, build community, and authentically meet each other across multiple faiths, backgrounds, and cultures. In the spirit of this shared holy space, we acknowledge and pay respect to the Abenaki people on whose traditional lands Dartmouth stands, and to all Native people here today. We are also honored to hear the musical voices of the Dartmouth College Gospel Choir, conducted by Artistic Director Walt Cunningham, and an address by our esteemed alumna, Dr. Lori Arvisa Alvord. On behalf of the William Jewett Tucker Center, the United Campus Ministers, and Dartmouth College, we welcome all who are gathered here. We remember those who are absent, but always present in our hearts. And we celebrate with gratitude that we have reached this sacred time and season. Holy One, may we take these moments of stillness and gravity together to pause to acknowledge the interconnections, the blessings, the hopes, and the responsibilities that lie ahead for our graduating students as they begin to mark this next step forward in their lives. I am pleased to welcome Reverend Tom Nordberg, member of the Dartmouth United Campus Ministers and interim pastor of the Church of Christ at Dartmouth College to offer the opening prayer, followed by Bishop Eric Freeman, who will share reflections as one parent on behalf of all those who have parented, guided, or mentored a student to this joyfully anticipated moment. Please rise. Let me begin by saying it has been an honor to have served the United Campus Ministries and to be among the Dartmouth community these past two years. Let us pray. Eternal Spirit, creator of this entire universe, originator of time and space, and true source of our contingent being, we acknowledge that we now seek to find you within this holy space, that we have experienced truth and knowledge within these hallowed halls, 
established by spiritually awakened colonialists who expressed their vox clamantis in deserto, their voice crying within this wilderness, and that we are most privileged to walk upon this same ground considered sacred by the Abenaki people who built their great but now nearly vanquished nation in harmony with the primeval pine trees which were felled 201 half centuries ago. We come together on this splendid day, O oh God, to pray for our graduates here at Dartmouth College. We give thanks for their achievements. We give you praise for the wisdom and understanding they have acquired during their tenure at what will become on the morrow their alma mater. We ask that you give them yet further guidance as they seek to recall within themselves the memories of your knowledge and truth of which you have afforded them but a glimpse during these years of intentional study and reflection. We pray these things so that they may continue to excel in scholarship and leadership, so that they may prosper and flourish in their respective vocations, so that they may come alive to the joy to be found in sacrificial service to others. Protect them, we pray, from preoccupation with destructive materialism and trivial self-centeredness. We pray for the parents, families, and friends of our graduates. We give thanks for their perseverance and dedication as they have sponsored their graduates to this point. And we ask that you empower them to learn to accept a new manner of offering to their graduates further nurture and guidance. We pray in thanksgiving for the faculty, staff, and administrators who have guided this class of 2017 through these years of research and discernment. We give thanks for their leadership, scholarship, teaching, mentoring, and service. And we ask that you empower them to persevere in the ongoing work of forming, informing, and transforming present and future students at Dartmouth College. We pray for the greater Dartmouth College community of students, faculty, staff, and alumni. We give thanks for the greatness that this college has achieved and will achieve to your divine glory. We ask you to inspire all hearts and minds to pursue and attain even greater knowledge and insight so that true justice and a sincere integrity of mercy may prevail. Finally, we pray that you guide this community our nation, and the whole global reach of humanity toward healing, wholeness, and reconciliation toward each other and toward your natural creation. In all these things, O oh God, do we seek to fulfill your will that we remain steadfast in our faithfulness and loyal in our love so that we offer to you on this day honor and glory for this most celebratory occasion. Praise and thanksgiving be given to you. Let the congregation say, Amen. Please be seated. Dean Litwin, fellow clerics, and campus officials. In the tradition of our faith, we'd say the Lord be with you. Maya Angelou, the late Maya Angelou, several years ago is reported to have said that of all the virtues, courage is the most important. Because without courage, none of the other virtues can be consistently practice, whether it's what we would call the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, or the former three cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, and restraint. She argued that courage is most important. And as a parent who has served in raising a student for the class of 2017, I am confident that our students have reached this pivotal moment because of, first, their courage. 
Certainly, uh, we are excited and we commend our students for their competence and for all that they have accomplished. But I too agree that one of the most important attributes that has been cultivated for our students over these last four years is the virtue of courage. As a parent, I want to encourage our students to hold on to that courage. Courage actually is one of the virtues that allows us to live a life that is more than simply the degree we achieve or the next job that we receive. Please, the jobs, yes or maybe a promotion, maybe the things you acquire. But courage allows us to live a more meaningful life, to tap into our best in life. The ancient Greeks actually had multiple words that, they trans that we translate into life. Two of those words, one is bios, the other is zoe. Bios life, one could argue, and this isn't an exact translation, but one could argue it is the material life, it's the things we accomplish, it's the degrees we have, it's the jobs we uh, are able to, 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 uh, to, to receive and the opportunities we're able uh, to, to, to achieve. But, but Zoe life is a little bit more meaningful. It, it is the thank you that can't be taken back. It's the kind gesture that you do for someone that can't do anything else for you. It takes courage to live that latter kind of life. And I want to, again, speak to this wonderful class on behalf of all parents and challenge you, while you are achieving all the wonderful things, tap into that greater life, that Zoe life. We thank God for all of the wonderful instructors, for deans that helped to pull that out of our students. I saw it personally with my own child, that her her, her greatest achievement was not what job I get or what grade I get, and certainly we're thankful for that, but what difference am I going to make? Zoe life allows us to live something that's unconquerable. You can lose jobs. Trust me, you're gonna have some challenges along the way. Houses, they come and go, but Zoe life gives you an unconquerable trait, something that cannot be taken away. In fact, there is a Latin word that's used, uh, and it's entitled Invictus. It means unconquered. A poem was penned by William Ernest Henley several years ago, and for uh, nearly 40 years, he wrestled with tuberculosis. But he had tapped into Zoe life, true quality of life, not just life based on quantity, but on quality. And he, he penned these words under the title Invictus while wrestling with tuberculosis of the bones. He said, out of the night that covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole, I think whatever gods may be, but my unconquerable soul, in the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloodied but unbound. Beyond this place of wrath and tears, looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. Matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And so to the class of 2017, on behalf of all parents, guardians, surrogates, loved ones, we encourage you to operate in the courage that allows you to live the best life, to do those things that are unconquerable. And I close with the Mosaic blessing from the parents of 2017. We pray that the Most High keep you, bless you, and keep you, that his face will shine upon you and be gracious unto you, that he would turn his countenance towards you and give you peace. Shalom, shalom, amen.
A reading from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Since high school, I've read and reread this passage whenever I had a Bible in my hands, simply because I found it so beautiful. Now, I'm grateful for the chance to reflect on what it means to me. This passage is not about positively thinking your way out of life's inevitable roadblocks. 
Instead, it's about facing those struggles head on and maintaining your faith in your ideals, in your commitments, and in God. In my first couple of years at Dartmouth, I had no idea what I was doing. I changed my major multiple times, tried out new extracurriculars every term, and was constantly meeting new people. But by junior year, I started to develop my own sense of who I am and what I value. Research, teaching, and engaging critically with my faith and the big questions of what it all means. But now, once again, just like freshman year, I find myself in a time of transition. The path after Dartmouth seems amorphous and unclear once again. But even in the face of this uncertainty, St. Paul's letter to the Philippians reminds us to remember our commitments and our values and to keep our hearts and minds content in God's love. I will carry these words with me long after I leave Dartmouth. The slums are not part of our world, the Common App essay I wrote four years ago read. No, they're behind a brick wall in my grandfather's backyard in Bhopal, India. And so I ignored them, there, only a foot away. Yet our mouths tasted the same tangy burst of the pomegranate seeds, our ears heard the same feed of the speaker phones as they came alive across Bhopal for the daily evening prayer to Mecca, and the same temple bells toll as they began their hymns to Ram and Krishna. They are us, we are them. We presume ourselves to be special, but it is time I understood that we are not so different, that all my life I have lived in America and looked forward, never glancing back, that there are humans behind the wall. And so a hand always finds its way to the edge, and it is time I help them up. 18-year-old me had some hard-hitting goals. <laughs> How I was going to help, I didn't know. All I knew was that I felt a deep sense of community and obligation to parts of my birth city of Bhopal, India that I had never seen or known. Of course, I'd love to believe I was being profound, but my belief that everyone and everything is connected is deeply Hindu. It comes from the concept of Atma, or the soul. Hindus believe that all beings are connected through one soul. So if you hurt another being, you are in fact hurting, hurting yourself. A majority of my senior year has been dedicated to directing Dartmouth's outdoor pre-orientation program called TRIPS. It is a way for first years to connect with other first years, connect upperclassmen to first years, connect all of us to nature. By recognizing how intertwined we all really are, I see building community in the incoming class of 2021 as an avenue for change and equality at our college. For us 17s, leaving is not the end. Graduating is not the end. It is making space for 21s who will occupy a structure that is better than the ones that the 13s left us because we work to make it that way. I see that one moment, one idea, one part of the natural world, or even one generation of students connects to the next even when they are not aware of how tied they are to one another. I believe that you take a part of Dartmouth with you and you leave a part of yourself behind. I am changed because of the place, and to a smaller degree, the place is changed because of me. What Hinduism urges us all to do, and what Dartmouth has allowed me to do, is question myself and everything I take for granted to better understand myself. My senior year of high school, I wrote a common app essay about my grandfather, Bhopal, and the slums right behind my grandfather's house. My senior year of college, I wrote a Fulbright proposal about my grandfather, Bhopal, and the slums right behind my grandfather's house. I don't believe in endings. Leaving India at the age of five and leaving high school four years ago and leaving Dartmouth now has led me to this point. I'm pursuing a Fulbright in Bhopal next year, and I believe it'll be good for the soul. Shabbat Shalom. Dartmouth has been the journey of truly epic proportions and is the theme of transition to which I will briefly speak here today. In the uncertain, exciting, and terrifying times I have experienced at Dartmouth, two lines of Hebrew from Rabbi Nachman of Breslov have sustained me 
and led to immense personal growth. The words are kol haolam kulo gesher tsar meod, vahaikar lo lefached kalal. The direct English translation is the whole world is a very narrow bridge. The important thing is not to be afraid. In the physical sense, of course, we all cross bridges often. And now talking about my Dartmouth journey, I find it incredibly ironic that I literally crossed a bridge from Norwich to Hanover when I first arrived here. And when I leave as a graduate tomorrow afternoon, I will be crossing once again over that bridge as a different person. Yet like most things in Judaism, there are endless routes of interpretation for reflections on faith. And of course, Rabbi Nachman refers to larger themes than physical bridges. Bridges are transitions that take us from the familiarity of now to the uncertainty of the future. They emphasize the joyful moments of every day and they sustain us through the most challenging moments in our lives. In my life, Gesher Tsar Ma'od, the narrow bridge, has bridged many transitory periods. In the practicing of my faith, Rabbi Nachman's words serve as a musical metaphor for togetherness and community. When I lead Shabbat services, I use these two lines in song to bring everyone back together as a community from the solitude of the Amidah, a moment of silent meditation and prayer. In this way, I use Gesher Tsar Me'od, the narrow bridge, to reflect on not only the importance of individuality, but also the sacredness of community. After leading the congregation in this song for years, these Hebrew lines have grown in meaning to me personally. And one lesson in particular has become clear. When we cross bridges and shift from one stage of life to the next, we do not, and in the best of circumstances, should not, need to transition alone. In services, there is the warmth and the comfort of communal prayer as we transition from a week of difficult work to the relaxation of Shabbat. But I have faced innumerable opportunities and challenges at Dartmouth, outside of the synagogue, when I have felt uncertain and terrified. What helped me cross these very narrow bridges and tempered my fears the most was when I had others there to assist me in the transition. It was from the help of my closest friends that I was able to overcome the grief from the suicide of a longtime friend my sophomore year. And in this way, and many others, crossing the very narrow bridge in good company has sustained me. Rabbi Nachman's words have been key to me in my Jewish faith and the most difficult moments of my life but they also have served to reinforce the most joyful and the most fulfilling decisions I have made and the opportunities I have sought out. I try not to be afraid of new experiences. And this mindset has led to my branching out and expanding my horizons of interests and activities. In particular, has led to my new infatuation with the outdoors and appreciation of the simplest yet the most spectacular things that nature has to offer. This mindset led me to volunteer on Vox Crew for first year trips last year, through which I spent three of the most amazing weeks of my life in the woods to help incoming freshmen transition to Dartmouth. The irony is also not lost on me that my appreciation for the narrow bridge has led to my helping others to cross their own bridges from high school to Dartmouth. Now that I am graduating and transitioning to a new stage of my life, I find it remarkable that Rabbi Nachman's two lines have informed my Dartmouth experience to this extent. Just as I have used Gesher Tsar Ma'od to bring together a Jewish community here in Hanover each week, I hope that in the years to come, these same words will welcome me into new communities, sustain me through any difficult times that may arise, and continue to bring out the beauty of the little things in my life and everyone's lives. Thank you, and Shabbat Shalom. Hello, and thank you all so much for being here to celebrate this milestone with us. Um, thank you for being here in this moment of transition, um, this moment that is a bridge between what is past and what is to come. And it's full of anticipation and excitement and some nervousness. Um, and I thank you that we don't have to, to transition alone. Thank you for being here. I'm so grateful for all of the experiences I've had here at Dartmouth. So today I'm going to share a song with you entitled Bridges. Um, I composed it earlier this year. You can find the lyrics in the center of your programs. The song is about the fact that we are inherently connected to each other 
though often distanced by fears and misconceptions. We have to do the work of building bridges to overcome these divisions. The time is now for us to awaken and participate in this work, aspiring towards empathy and healing. My experience at Dartmouth has revolved around this type of work and doing it particularly through music. I know I'm emerging a better person, a deeper version of the person I was with a more robust perspective. So thank you to every person who has invested in making the past four years possible. Um, can we just take a moment to applaud the sacrifices, contributions, and encouragement of family, friends, and mentors? <laughs> It's truly been a privilege to spend the past four years growing here, from traveling to three continents, to studying five different languages, to making friends from all across the world. Throughout my senior year, I completed a project that centered on intercultural musical collaboration. I co-wrote songs with artists in different countries to create a full album. It was a beautiful process of co-creation as we used music to build bridges across cultural and linguistic differences and even geographical distances. The piece I'm about to sing is the culminating song on the album. I'm also going to be accompanied by Ms. Evelyn Ellis on the clarinet. Um, and you're all welcome to sing, to join in singing the chorus, or the, the last couple lines of the chorus, which once I trans transition to the piano, I'll sing as an example, I'll sing the part that you'll be singing if you are so inclined to join in. Um, thank you so much. So as I mentioned, you're welcome to join in, and I'm just going to sing an example um, at the end of the course. The words are, to love is to build a bridge. Um, so it goes. To love is to build a bridge to love is to build a bridge yes so when you hear that part come please join Across the distance You are no stranger to my soul As a heartbeat A love insistent Now we arise from our repose Finally, finally it's time to heal I believe, I believe that we can build a bridge across the sea of fear, a bridge between the far and near, and 
And as this moment echoes on, our anthem carried forth in song to love is to build a bridge. You sound beautiful. To love is to build a bridge face to face now with hope amidst doubt. Still in your eyes, I see my own so divided. By fear misguided, we overcome by love alone. Finally, finally, it's time to heal. And I believe, I believe that we can build a bridge across the sea of fear. A bridge between the far and near And as this moment echoes on Our anthem carried forth in song To love is To be To love is to build a bridge. Let's sing that one more time. To love is to build a bridge. To To build a bridge. A verse from the Metta Sutra. May all beings be happy and secure. Whatever living beings there are, feeble or strong, long, stout, or medium, short, small, or large, seen or unseen, those dwelling far or near, those who are born or those who await rebirth, may all beings without exception be happy. Just as a mother would protect her only child at risk of her own life, even so, let us cultivate a boundless heart towards all beings. This verse refers to metta, a quality translated as loving kindness or benevolence, the genuine wish for others to be happy. It's one of the Buddhist four immeasurables, metta, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. I've returned to the Metta Sutra again and again during my time at Dartmouth. It always reorients my perspective and helps keep my priorities in order in the midst of hectic days, reminding me to value the happiness of everyone around me despite deadlines and responsibilities. The sutra is used for meditation and chanting and one can adjust it as you like. Sometimes I've changed it to may beings not finished with finals and those finished with finals be happy. Um, I have seen incredible examples of metta in the dedication of upperclassmen to mentor underclassmen in our strong Dartmouth culture of paying it forward. I first noticed this um, with my trip leaders when I arrived and in all the upperclassmen who volunteered hundreds of hours for trips to welcome the incoming class. 
Shortly after, I remember going to my first Cabin and Trail meeting. I really thought the 14s were demigods and really loved learning from them how to build a fire and how to lead a trip of my peers into our mountains. Four years later, now my peers and I are those seniors who are passing down those skills and the wisdom we've learned to the new freshmen. I love the feeling of being part of the unbroken line of passing down that wisdom through the years. I also see Meta and the faculty who have opened up their doors for stimulating discussions during office hours or conversation over breakfast at Luz in the staff members who have mentored me and shared stories and laughter over long talks with tea and friends who in initiate spontaneous adventures and support each other. As we close this chapter of our lives, I hope we have left Dartmouth that much of a better place for those who come after us and that we approach what comes next with the spirit of Meta. Thank you. A few years ago, I was attending an artist lecture for the studio art department. The visiting photographer had traveled the world shooting pictures of ancient archeological sites. On one excursion, he found himself in the Middle East, Jordan to be exact. While he was there, he passed Petra, a rock-cut city carved as early as the fifth century BC. He considered photographing it, but was pressed for time and wasn't sure he'd make it to his final destination. I'll come back another day, he told himself. As he was about to move on, a fellow traveler persuaded him to stop and take what turned out to be a breathtaking photograph. A year later, he found himself in Jordan again. Thankful to have more time on this trip, he returned to shoot the scene he had so haphazardly captured a year ago. When he arrived, he found that that singularly beautiful portion of Petra had crumbled to dust. Recounting this story to us that day, he paused and murmured, never assume that anything you love will ever be the same again. Those words have resonated with me throughout my time at Dartmouth. They speak to more than an opportune photograph or the decay of physical structures. They call us to notice the process of change, to reflect, to check in with ourselves, to check in with others. And like taking a photograph, they ask us to honor these moments of change, to bless the transitions in our lives. We can honor these moments with thoughtful and intentional action. This is hard, especially at a place like Dartmouth, where change happens at seemingly breakneck speed. It is challenging to step away from the academic rigor and the demands of the job market. It can be even harder to determine what our values are outside of the Dartmouth-imposed ones, such as GPAs and internships. But I've met people who have done it. In the moments I've slowed down to notice, I've seen incredible people committing themselves to justice work. I've befriended astoundingly resilient students, particularly women and students of color, who spend countless hours writing, thinking, protesting, creating, loving, to shape this school in the best image of themselves. I've watched friends grapple with the meaning of a Dartmouth degree, ultimately redoubling their efforts to break stereotypes of what Dartmouth students do with their immense privilege. And I've seen professors and staff put their physical and emotional energy as well as their livelihoods on the line to support us all in this work. These people have seen Dartmouth changing and they work their hardest to make those changes positive and to take care of each other when they're not. Although Dartmouth is old, it is not Petra and I doubt it will crumble anytime soon. But as we move through it, we will change with it in beautiful and unexpected ways. Like those who I've had the honor of befriending, we can stop notice the transformation, and work hard to make the most of it. We can consider our values and make sure we are oriented towards them at every moment. And whether it be through a photograph, justice work, or any other passion or commitment, we must show gratitude for the people and the moments we love before they are never the same again. Thank you. I will be reciting from the Quran, and so I will first be reading in Arabic and then translating into English. 
Uh, and this is verses 1 through 9 from Surah Ar-Rahman from the Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Ar-Rahman Alam al-Quran Khalaq al-Insan Allamahu al-Bayan Ash-Shamsu wal-Qamru bi-Husban Wa an-Najmu wal-Shajru yasjudan وَأَسْمَاءَ رَفَعَهَا وَوَدَعَ الْمِزَانِ إِلَّا تَتَغَوْ فِي الْمِزَانِ وَأَقِيمُوا الْوَزْنَ بِالْقِسْتِ وَلَا تَخْسِرُوا الْمِزَانِ In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. The most merciful taught the Qur'an, created man, and taught him eloquence. The sun and the moon move by precise calculation, and the stars and trees prostrate. And the heaven he raised and imposed the balance, that you not transgress within the balance, and establish weight and justice, and do not make deficient the balance. These past few months, it has become more difficult for some people to be who they are, and because of that, to find the balance in their lives. Being Muslim at Dartmouth hasn't been the easiest thing, but it also hasn't been the most difficult. While at Dartmouth, I found time in those busy days to take a moment, a breath, to hit reset, not once or twice, but five times a day with my five daily prayers. Waking up before sunrise to prepare for the day ahead has helped me find an inner balance that has sustained me and carried me through these past four years. But while here, I've also observed and been affected by changing times. Two years ago, on a trip sponsored by Dartmouth and the Tucker Center, I was in DC and running late for a prayer with no mosque in sight. So my friends and I decided to pray in front of the Capitol building. Today, I don't know if that's something I can feel safe doing. But what I've also learned is that when the world around me seems full of ignorance and darkness, my role in maintaining the balance is to respond with light and understanding. As the Quran teaches, the sun and the moon move by precise calculations and that you should not transgress within the balance. Creating and sustaining this harmony and balance is a personal commitment I make to myself every day. One that I know will carry me through this transition, transition and whatever else may come my way. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Rebecca Byron, and I have the profound privilege of serving Dartmouth's undergraduate community as dean of the college. Today especially, I'm truly honored to have the privilege of introducing our next speaker. As we've heard so, from so many already this afternoon, graduation weekend is a turning point. It invites us all to reflect on the ways in which we find meaning in our lives. How do we find purpose? What is a life well lived? These are urgent questions that we have to ask ourselves every day. Dr. Lori Alvord is our very special guest. She's a member of the Dartmouth class of 1979, the mother of a member of the class of 2020, an award-winning Stanford-trained physician, and the first Navajo woman to become a board-certified surgeon. A healer in the truest sense of the word, Dr. Alvord's wise, holistic perspective has been featured on NPR, in a PBS documentary called Medicine Woman, and in guest lectures around the country, including the world-class Monadnock Summer Lyceum. Today, she comes full circle to share unique insights from her own experience that can serve as a model and inspiration to all of us. Dr. Alvord. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, President Hanlon, Provost Deaver, Dean Litwin, Dean Byron, Dartmouth faculty and administration, Dartmouth clergy and religious and spiritual leaders of the community and the larger community, the graduates, the families of this community, thank you for this opportunity. It is both an honor and a privilege to give the baccalaureate address for the class of 2017. If you would not mind, I'd like to ask my daughter to come up and um, disrobe me because we are going Navajo now. So, let me just stay, say at the start, um, well, well, let me first introduce my children. Uh, this is Christopher Kodiak Alvord and Caitlin Alvord, class of 20. Caitlin um, is just finished her year, and Cody just graduated from Yale a uh, couple of weeks ago with the class of 17. There go Bulldogs. Part of this talk is scripted, carefully scripted, and part of this talk is not scripted. And the part that's scripted, I tend to think of as you and your education and your four years here, and then the part that is unscripted is that part of leaving and going off into uncharted waters where it's a little bit scary and a little bit dangerous. And so I'll stay with the safe for a short time and then I'll go over to what's a little bit more um, difficult. Uh, I wanted to say at the beginning, I don't normally dress traditional this way, uh, but my luggage did not arrive with me to Boston. And I was told and when I arrived at 5 that it would come on the 7.30 flight. And so then I waited and it didn't come on the 7.30 flight. And I didn't want to miss the Dartmouth coach coming up to Hanover. And so I came without it and I hear it's still in Philadelphia. So um, I have my, my jewelry, my silver. My daughter loaned me her one of her tops. We went to Penny's and got some pants. I borrowed her moccasins, and she's wearing black boots, which she should be wearing her beautiful moccasins instead, but this is how we roll. Uh, thank you. It is such an honor to be here. Um, it, just, it just is, I just have to say that. Um, I've been uh, with the Dartmouth community off and on throughout my entire life, um, but I did never expected, I gave the convocation here once, but I never expected to come and give the baccalaureate, so just thank you. My address is titled, A Life Well Lived, Inspiration from Navajo Ceremonies. I first wanted to discuss the framework of our ceremonies and then describe how a life well lived can be reached by following the principles of the ceremonies. As a surgeon in my professional life, I am able to bring healing to my patients, drawing together the best of medical research and surgical innovation gained over the last century of medical progress. Yet I also carry with me another kind of healing, which comes from my people, the Navajo, the Diné. This healing cannot be dated, it is very ancient. It includes the concepts of words that are healing that are quite different from what terms usually connote in the halls of medical schools. Part of my vision in life is to combine the best of both worlds, as different as they are. I decided I need to, needed to learn to become both a surgeon and a healer, and so I went back to the healers of my own tribe for answers, and I found far more than I ever thought possible. Western medicine has accumulated millions of libraries filled with books, and these books hold the knowledge accumulated over our entire course of history. But the question is, which books should we read? What is the most important knowledge? Cultures that did not have those libraries 
cultures with oral traditions passed their very most sacred and their very most important knowledge down through their ceremonies. And this is why I believe that the ceremonies are the distillation of the very most important knowledge gained over generation after generation and that that should be passed down through our time and through the ages and generations of young people. And that is why the ceremonies are so sacred and so special. Our people still practice those ceremonies that have been with us since ancient times, and within them lies a blueprint for how to live an enriched, healthy life and how to heal, heal others, how to live a life well lived. The foundation rests on a central spiritual premise and it is very interesting that our, our, our uh, student who spoke of the Hindu traditions uh, very clearly mirrored this, but also the Buddhist traditions as well as many other cultures have a very, very similar belief system. But what we say is that all things in the universe, including humans, are created by a life force, and that life force is within all things that life force connects all things. That life force is our creator, that we are part of, that we are not separate from, and because we are not separate from it, we are not separate from one another either. We are each other. And because of that, every single person is important. Every single Every single precious life is important. We teach in our ceremonies that all wisdom comes from Sa'anagai Bike Hojo. Sa'anagai Bike Hojo is the name of our creator. It is um, living, it is described literally and translated as living your life in harmony and balance, but it is a, very much like the yin and yang. Sa'anagai is Father Sky, Beke Hojo is Mother Earth, Sa'anagai is fem um, male, Beke Hojo is female. It is to live your life in spiritual harmony and balance. Healers, medicine men of our tribe, have described this, con this creator as universal mind, and what that means is that our creator has a consciousness and we are all part of that consciousness and that our universe has a consciousness. Because it is within all things, we as human beings are not separate from other humans or the rest of the world. This belief is shared by many other cultures with some variation, and we are in ongoing con communication and communion with our own creator. The analogy that recently came to me from Christian beliefs is that concept that is called grace. It is the free and unmerited favor of God. It is the bestowal of God's blessings. Forgive me, I cry very easily. The ceremonies teach Navajos to live in something called hojo. It is a word that is a combination of beauty, harmony, wisdom, balance, and peace and equanimity. It is not too different from grace. It is not too different from metta. And by the way, I, I was also part of the um, Zen group in the Upper Valley led by Alan Fields, and thank you so much for your presence because it brings me strength and, and happiness. It is a teaching, Hojo, that Humans should honor and respect other human beings and all living creatures. When practiced, this way is capable of enhancing family and workplace stability. Strong interpersonal relationships help build strong families and communities. We also respect and protect the animal world and the environment as much as we protect ourselves. And that is why we call the Earth Mother, and that is why we call the Sky Father, and that is why we refer to the animals as brother and sister. When you have a close familial relationship, when you have a close spiritual relationship to the natural world, those things, family and your sacred beliefs, 
are what you will protect and defend at all cost. And that is why there is no DAPL, no DAPL. We'll go on on that in just a minute. <laughs> Strong relationships extend to the health and healing of all things, not just human, but to our whole community and the natural world, because as several speakers have said already, everything is interconnected. Everything is interconnected. When we, it sounds like a mystical concept, it sounds like a mystical thing, but it is not. The air we breathe in, when we breathe out, it is breathed by our plants, and they are enriched by the carbon dioxide. When we eat an apple, we are carbon-based creatures, and we eat that apple, and it becomes part of us, and it gives us energy, and then we eliminate it. It goes back into the ground, and those carbons continue out to make more carbon-based creatures. We are very, very deeply interconnected to our environment regardless of who or who is not part of the Paris Treaty. When Europeans first encountered Native American cultures, they dismissed much of it as inferior. Indigenous religions were considered primitive compared to other theologies, but there is a connectedness and a complexity within the ceremonies that mirrors the co complexity and beauty of the universe in which we live. And in our tribe, ceremonies are beautiful are blueprints for how to live a life that is whole and balanced and a life connected to all of creation and a life that, liver, that, <laughs> a life that honors all living things. Our healing and our spirituality are one and the same. Ceremonies empower the mind through purification and through visualizing the future in a positive way. An attempt to live in harmony and balance reduces conflict, as you can imagine which helps reduce stress. And reducing stress has healthy side effects. The field of psychoneuroimmunology, which is the, basically the field of the mind's influence on the body, also known as mind-body medicine, has shown that stress and depression are capable of suppressing our immune system, which interferes with our ability to fight infections and to defend against cancers. Likewise, mind states influence our neurotransmitters, our endorphins, our cortisol levels, our antibodies, our natural killer cells, etc. Our ceremonies help by healing our mind and purifying our mind to protect and empower the mind. That in turn helps reduce stress and helps our immune systems fight disease. One of our medicine men, Thomas Hattathli, said this, the mind is the foremost energy that we have as people. Ceremonies are done to empower the mind and if that happens, the body will follow in healing. I would also add that the recent research into the mind states of some of our longtime Eastern Buddhist meditators have shown very similar things, that the left prefrontal cortex shows increased activity. It is a place where you experience happiness and well-being. And our cortex, their cortexes were also thicker on functional MRIs. So there is a very profound physical um, change that occurs in the brains of people who practice some of the practices of which we describe today and some of the ways that we can keep ourselves whole and, and um, free of disease over time. Our ceremonies also help with physical wellness. They help us to develop healthy minds and bodies. During the girl's puberty ceremony, which is known as the Kinnatha, the young girl runs toward the east at sunrise, and everyone follows her, and no one can catch her. She is too strong. The prayers during that ceremony encourage her to be strong and to be powerful. Our ceremonies encourage this process through both physical and mental purification. Hojo includes thinking about the future in a good way and is very similar now to what we call positive thinking. As we move forward in medicine, it will be important to understand these, that our physical, our physical strength also comes from our mind states. And our minds and their, their well-being are every bit as important to the process of healing as the attention and treatment that is given to our bodies. 
As we learn more about healing, art has emerged as a healing force. When the mind encounters certain forms of art, and let me just witness here, that gospel choir, oh my God. <laughs> Woo! have not felt anything that powerful in such a long time. And if you got down on me for texting during this prep process, it was to ask my daughter to bring me Kleenex. <laughs> oh, lordy, as Comey would say. Anyway, that was really unscripted. Where did that come from? Ah. When the mind encounters certain forms of art, the joy, delight, and awe that it experiences is capable of reducing stress as well and of counteracting depression and thereby also helps our immune system. Navajo ceremonies include layers upon layers of art woven together and integrated from the beauty of the prayers and the chants and the images they evoke to the powerful rhythms of the drums and the music that carry the words forward Art moves through ceremonies as both the foreground and the background, as both the earth and the air. Art is expressed in paintings made with sand, sand paintings. The yeas, also known as kachinas, are spiritual garden guardians, are represented in the sand paintings, and they are the visual images of the stories that the ceremonies describe. And in the same way, our dancers represent these spiritual beings and animal garden guardians that are described by the ceremonies. Our headdresses are made of deer skin, buffalo skin, eagle feathers, spruce branches, buckskin clothing and moccasins are worn, and even the smallest objects used in ceremonies are art forms, medicine bundles that contain beautiful corn pollen bags, prayer feathers, small carved animal spiritual guardians, and earth from our four sacred mountains. The combined effect is a tapestry that deeply endorses the belief that art has the power to heal. And if you want one of these eagle feathers, I don't blame you. That is a very natural urge, um, just saying. I also want to um, reach backward to Dean Laramore, who was the dean of the college uh, some time ago, well over a decade, I want to say, who also led our processions with a um, cap and gown with a cap with an eagle feather. And so this is a tribute also to Dean Laramore. Thank you. Ceremonies are also performed, of course, for the purpose of healing. Many of the forces of healing used in ceremonies have already been described. These principles are now beginning to be used by other healing systems as well. Western medicine is waking up to realize that healing exists beyond procedures and medication. Studies have started to prove the power of other healing realms, such as support group therapy, music therapy, healing in the arts, animal therapy, massage therapy, and so on. The research is still in its beginning stages, but points to the concept that healing can be influenced by multiple forces within our lives, and that we are deeply interconnected to all aspects of our lives, and that we may use these interconnections to achieve healing and live our very best lives. For those of you who are going on to be healers, could I get a, who, who's going into medicine and who is, who is, or who is in medicine today? We must have many people in the, in the congregation heading into medicine. Okay. Caring for patients is a very profound privilege. We have license to travel to a country that no other person can visit to the inside of another person's body. It is a sacred and holy place. To perform surgery there is to move in a place where spirits are. It is a place you should not enter if you do not have hojo. And even if you do not believe that the human body is sacred, please remember that it is very special, especially to the person who owns it. It should be touched with great respect and great care. And, through a surgical, and though a surgical procedure focuses on one single organ, when I operate, I always try to remember I am opening a person, a human being. I am putting my hands inside their body, and I try to remain aware of that whole person, mind, body, and spirit, 
and the harmony of their entire being. The medicine men tell us that the air we breathe travels all around the earth and has existed on our planet for millions of years. It is called nilche. Breathing connects you to the rest of the world in this way. The words that move out from your lips, these same words move from within you and travel out into the world. They can bring healing through the care with which you speak to those you, that you encounter and through the gentleness with which you speak words that might be hard for them to hear. Those might be words of end of lifetimes. Those might be words of very difficult, difficult medical illnesses. The word, your own words will bear your mark. How we touch our patients is also very important. The wisdom of our tribes say that our hands are very special. There are universal winds, the part of the life force that I described previously, that enter through the whirls of the palms and the feet and the top of the head. Our hands are special and they are our ambassadors to the rest of the world. They carry our goodwill. Your hands will touch many patients over a lifetime and they will serve you well when you can touch a patient with gentleness. And now I'm going to the really unscripted part of this. Um, Dartmouth has, has given me a foundation on which to build a life well lived. My first four years coming here, I was young, I was only 16, and I came from the reservation, what we call the res, and um, I just didn't know a darn thing. I was so, so naive to the rest of the world. I really had no idea what was out there in that great, big, beautiful world. And I was frightened of it, but Dartmouth gave me the foundation to start and to begin again. It taught me how to navigate through the world. It taught me also the foundation for the, for the later training and academics that I would pursue. We um, don't know what it's like when we go out there, but I have to tell you that it's, it's, uh, it's intimidating for, pe for people like us that come from very humble places, from people, from reservations, from inner cities, from barrios, from backgrounds where we are people of color, from people with um, low socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, it is a very different place and it is frightening and scary, but Dartmouth has given me and those who come on through this school the courage and the ability to move through and on into the next realm of whatever we pursue in academics. And I want to say that when I was first, first here, um, I was living, well, my second year, because you don't get to live in the native house in the first year, right? My second year here, I was living in the Native American house, and across the, across uh, in upstairs, across the dorm, upstairs in a little bitty room, was a native kid from Louisiana. That kid, he always had a smile on his face. He was, he was full of goodwill. That kid was a whole lot sharper than I ever was. And when I first knew him, he wanted to be a priest. And that's what I thought that he would go on to be. And he was kind, and he was good, and he was honest. And his name was Bruce Dutu. He was just nominated to be the dean of the faculty here. Think of it. Think of it. A res kid from Louisiana. He's withdrawn his nomination despite the support of mo the vast majority of the faculty here. And I would say that the whole Dartmouth community should run after him and grab him before he's gone because he stands on the shoulders of Samson Ockham. If we are to be a united community at Dartmouth, a community that was created in the 1700s for Native people, it is beyond time that we have Native people as part of our leadership.
Moving on, and I am almost done because I know it's hot here. To live a well-lived life is to build beauty in all areas of your life, right? We focus, when we send our, our students out into the world, we focus on academic preparation uh, especially, or, or it, in, we emphasize that. But there are so many other parts of our lives that you need to develop to, ve to, ve to have a life well lived. And first and foremost among those is what I would call the creation of a framework, a mosaic, a tapestry of friends and family that will nourish you, that will love you, that will sustain you over time. I never was told that. I mean, I'm part of a tribe, but I'm a serious introvert. I didn't figure it out till I was much, much later in my life, and then I began to intentionally find that community, my own community, find those people that would nourish and sustain me through my deepest and darkest times. And I have to say that I went through a very dark time recently. I don't know that it's ever been quite as dark for me, where I questioned everything that I was and I questioned everything that I had done. And, um, and I began to feel a sense of, of uh, PTSD. And um, that group brought me back. They brought me back. And um, they encouraged me to continue on my own journey uh, and to continue to fight for what I thought was important. And um, as a result of that, one of the most recent things that I've done is gone on to do an advanced surgical laparoscopy training program at Cleveland Clinic. And I can tell you that, that Cleveland is one of the finest places in the entire world to train, and I just want to thank them for, for everything they've done for me in terms of, of restoring my own sense of myself. Couple more things beyond building that, that community of your, that is your community, that is people, the people that you love, the people that you can reach out to. You should also move on out beyond that, beyond your comfort zone, because beyond your circle of friends and family, there will be others who need you. There will be others who are hurting. There will be others who, who have so much need. They may need shelter. They may need food. They may be coming from countries where their lives and their worlds have been devastated. I am talking about how America reaches out to the refugee population. And I am saying that we cannot be deterred with the thoughts and the talk today of shutting our doors. That is not what we were taught. Jesus said, I was a stranger and you took me in. Do we know that? Do we believe that? Reach past your circle of friends to, your, to the strangers. Be a friend to someone who never expected it in the first place, who owes you nothing and you know, owe nothing to them. Be that person. Be that force for good. Be an Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> yes, I do believe strongly in the Jedi. Yes, I do. I, I confess, I do. Secondly, uh, and this comes primarily from the Chinese teachings of the I Ching, um, is the concept that everything you do, every single action that you do, is a foundation of who you are and who you fully become. And you can make that whatever you want, but I would encourage you to make it into something of integrity, to make it into something of, of goodness, of honesty, of trust, being trustworthy. Every, every single part of your life is built on the previous parts of your life. Make that gorgeous beyond belief. Make it so that if someone mentions your name 
and accuses you of being a liar? I am thinking of a certain FBI director right now. Everyone would turn and say, uh, no, we know that person. We know who that person is. We know their life. We know who they are. They have done every single thing in their entire life built on honesty, trustworthiness, and upon doing the right thing. Be that kind of person. Be the person that no one doubts for a moment. Help to build your community. I've talked especially about reaching out to those who do not have enough, to refugees and others, but there are so many ways that you can help your community. There's so, so many needs out there. Find your passion, find your love, and then protect the animal world and the environment. First, I want to talk about the animal world because that's one of my favorite loves. I have three dogs. I told you I was part of a Zen practice, and um, I have those meditation cushions that are so cool. Yeah, I have those. My Pomeranian thinks they belong to her, and she will sit on them and, and uh, thank me for providing her with her cushions. But our animals have intelligence, and their intelligences are far greater than anything that we can imagine. You know, they are learning that the dolphins and the elephants have incredible intelligence. Um, I was looking recently, I think it came up on Twitter, it keeps coming up, these dogs, <laughs> this dog is stuck inside of a hedge. Has anybody seen that dog stuck inside a hedge? And, it, and the caption underneath it says something like, dog pretending he's not stuck in a hedge. You know, he's just happy, he's just grinning, he's like, yeah, I'm good. Nothing's going on here. He can't get out of the hedge. Imagine what kind of tell intelligence you have to have as an animal to bluff that you're not really what you're, what's going on right now. It's not really what's happening. You're bluffing. That, that takes a fair amount of intelligence, I have to say. I also recently just saw a study that uh, came out a couple of days ago that said that dogs and wolves they get their feelings hurt if they don't think they're being treated fairly. Like if one dog gets two biscuits and the other dog gets one biscuit. How much intelligence do you think it takes to figure out that, hmm, I'm not, I'm not quite, you know, things aren't working out so well for me here. Um, they are, they are our friends, they're for, for native people, they are our brothers, our sisters. We need to be sure that we protect our animal world. But beyond that, into the environment, there is so much that needs to be done. And I did mention the Paris Climate um, Treaty, but um, you know, there are um, places in, the, in, in our country, in our, in our planet, where certain features of the environment have been given personhood status. Certain rivers now have been given personhood status. The Ganges, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and the Yumana rivers in New, New Zealand uh, have been given the rights, the same rights as a person. And my question is, why doesn't the planet have personhood rights. Legal personhood rights. You know, we only get, we, this is an old, old statement, but we only have one planet. There's no planet B. So my hope is that we do everything in our, in our possible, everything possible to protect this planet, this gorgeous jewel that we live on for perpetuity, for our children, for our grandchildren, for, for all. Because we don't get a second chance and because it's uh, the right thing to do. Back to that right thing to do thing again. I'm gonna close with a Navajo prayer, remembering again that Hojo is translated as beauty, that's the what the anthropologist decided to use. So beauty is the word here that's hojo, but remember that hojo is grace, it's meta, it's all of that 
state of being that we all strive for, that we come together for this service to sustain us. Okay. Housemaid of dawn, housemaid of evening light, housemaid of dark cloud. Dark cloud is at the house's door. The trail out of it is dark cloud. The jagged lightning stands high upon it. Happily may I walk. Happily with abundant showers may I walk. Happily with abundant plants may I walk. Happily on the trail of pollen may I walk. May it be beautiful before me. May it be beautiful behind me. May it be beautiful below me. May it be beautiful above me. May it be beautiful all around me. In beauty, it is finished. Hojona Hasli, Hojona Hasli, Hojona Hasli, Hojona Hasli. Thank you. to the class of 2017. As we said in the first song, the road we must travel, there's a promise that we must make. For the riches will be plenty, <laughs> worth the risk and the chances that we take. So in the spirit of self-fulfillment prophecy, class of 17, I challenge you to go out there into the unknown knowing that you may have a journey that might be full of some bumps. But hold on, my brother, don't give up. Hold on, my sister, just look up. Know that there's a master plan in store for you if you just make it through. You see, God's going to blow your mind. He's going to make it worth your time. Because this is what he promises. That the best is yet to come. For you ain't seen nothing yet. So I say to those of you, whether you're white, yellow, black, or whatever color you are mixed with, I ask you to join us on this number. I know sometimes we're intimidated by this chapel, and sometimes we come in here and think that we cannot stand up on our feet and clap. I want to encourage you to do so if you feel so led to do so. We will not be offended. As a matter of fact, we'll feel that energy. The only thing I ask, and I say this all the time, we clap on beats two and four. So, <laughs> those of you who clap on one and three, not with this, okay? Amen, amen. Go ahead, Chuck Carlos. Amen. For the best is yet to come. <laughs> Give me a little more. Yeah, hold on. My
I hope we're all filled with the feeling of magnificence, hope, and purpose. Even as we celebrate this wonderful turning point for our graduates this weekend, we acknowledge and remember those we have lost. I want to ask you now to please join me in a moment of silence after I name the members of the class of 2017 who are no longer with us. Our hearts are with their families and friends and with all who have experienced loss this year. Summer Hammond, Tate Ramsden, Adam Wright, Thank you. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. When asked to do the closing prayer today, I couldn't think of what I should pray for. So I decided on a reminder instead, a reminder for myself first, and then the class leaving Dartmouth this weekend and joining the world. And I promise I did not coordinate this with Dr. Albert at all. But what I wanted to remind myself of is a verse from the Holy Quran that says, Ya amanu, kunu bil qist. O you who believe, stand up for justice. Shuhada'a lillahi wa law ala anfusikum. Bearing witness to God, even if against yourself, or against your own parents or relatives. If they were rich or poor. And God is more deserving of them. And do not follow your desires so that you are not just. And if you turn away from or deny justice, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُمْ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ خَبِيرًا Then verily, God is upon everything that you do very well aware. And the reason I wanted to just leave this parting message with everybody today is that in order for there to be true justice, in our world, all of us need to give up a little bit of the privilege that we have. Think out of our comfort zone, as Dr. Albert said. Be that puppy that had two cookies and take half of one and give it to the other dog so that other dog does not feel sad. And with that, I leave you with the prayer in the Islamic tradition that's given to somebody that's setting up or leaving out on their travels, which in the Arabic language is istodakumullah, or which means that I entrust you with God so that you may be safe and protected from everything on your journey. Thank you.